coming into the organizers. Um, there was a handout going around. I unfortunately did not know how popular the plague was, or at least the study of it, so that there might not be enough. Um, but uh, I hope that people can share. One of the difficulties in studying the successive waves of bubonic plague that began in the 540s CE, known to scholars as the Justinianic pandemic, is that the source base is so thin. Those contemporary histories that do discuss the plague note the devastation that it caused. However, given the overall paucity of sources for the period, for many of the regions that were affected by the disease, we have almost no text that tell of its impact. For instance, in Visigothic Hispania, uh, today's Portugal, Spain, and parts of southern France, only one author explicitly mentions the first wave of the Justinianic pandemic. This anonymous scribe scribbled a marginal notation in the continuation of the chronicle of Victor of Tanuna. Quote, in those days, the bubonic plague, the plaga inguinalis, ground down almost all of his body. This enigmatic text, with its language of grinding and evocation of the plague's wide scope, suggests that the plague did much harm to Visigothic Iberia. But it is, our, <coughs> excuse me, it is our only mention of the disease by name. Moreover, unlike other parts of the Mediterranean world, where historians of the time left long narrative accounts of the plague, in Hispania, no text explicitly discusses the social impact of the disease. This should be shocking. If the plague was as devastating as we think it was based on the accounts of contemporaries like Procopius and measured comparisons with more well-documented outbreaks like the 14th century, then there should have been sort of social consequences. And as a historian, it is my task to try to trace those consequences where I can. I believe that I have found a text that shows the reaction to the plague and the strains it placed on social structures and practices. This text is a canon from the Council of Valencia, a church council attended by bishops from southeastern Spain in 546 CE, just three or four years after the first wave of, plague, wave of plague hit Spain, and some fewer number of years after the outbreak ceased. The canon does not explicitly mention the plague, and at first glance may seem unrelated. However, I will argue in this paper that understood in its proper context, the fourth canon of the Council of Valencia represents rare evidence for the social impact of the first wave of the Justinianic pandemic in the Western Mediterranean. And that by analyzing it in this context, we can begin to test ways of looking for the impact of the plague in otherwise less than obvious texts. Now, to the text. Uh, the key passage I will address comes from the fourth canon, which is about the burial of bishops. Uh, it's number one, it's the only one on your handout, uh, if you have the handout. Um, but if not, I will, I will read it. Um, if, however, as is accustomed to happen, a bishop should die by a sudden death, and the neighboring priests are not able to come from far away, the dead body of the bishop should not be buried at once, but honorably entrusted for only one day with its night, and it should be placed on a bier apart from the others, not, parenthetically, without the company of brothers and religious men or the watchfulness of people singing psalms and served by presbyters with all diligence, until, with a bishop having been invited without delay from wherever, he, it's the dead bishop, should be solemnly entombed so that the occasion might be lifted from slander and the old custom for bearing bishops be protected. We must work through this text on to figure out two levels of interpretive problems. First, we have to figure out what this all means, and then we can try to figure out why it was decreed. I suggest that this text must be understood within the context of Episcopal displays of power through funerary practices in 6th century Iberia, practices which were threatened by the social chaos caused by the pandemic. To show this, I will have a close reading of the text in three parts beginning with the end and moving backwards. This close reading will involve the philological study of the canon itself 
and the specific archaeological context of Valencia, where the council was held and its host eventually buried. I'll begin with the so-called old custom for burying bishops. The broad concerns of the bishops of Visigothic Iberia can be seen in their funerary inscriptions, many of which have survived. These highlight the bishop's construction and repair of religious buildings, within which the bishop himself was often eventually buried, as well as their desire to associate themselves with saints and saintliness. The inscriptions also show a concern for the individuality of the bishops by commemorating their deeds and indicating where they are buried. This allowed the bishops, who were the new civilian elites of the cities, to engage in competitive displays of spiritual and temporal power in the vacuum left by a weak central state. Far from being an old custom, however, the set of practices that made up Episcopal burial developed over the course of the 6th century and reached their maturity near the time of the outbreak of the Justinianic pandemic. We find an ideal type for this ritual form in the Episcopal complex of La Moina in Valencia, Spain, which I visited this summer in the company of Albert Rivera y La Comba, uh, who excavated the site. Um, I took some pictures, but they turned out really terribly, so there's no PowerPoint. Um, there are two main early Christian buildings in Valencia. There's the Basilica at La Moina and the so-called Carcel de San Vicente nearby. Both have been excavated, although the contemporary cathedral sits on top of the Visigothic cathedral and has prevented a sort of thorough investigation. Uh, they form part of a large Episcopal complex, approximately 100 by 150 meters, that stood on top of a sort of the central region of the Roman town with sort of a shop-lined street and uh, opening up onto the forum. Uh, the, the Christian Basilica was renovated in the middle of the 6th century, probably by uh, the bishop, Justinianus, and a cruciform mausoleum was added. Justinianus, the bishop of Valencia, who hosted the council in 546 that I'm talking about, and died around 550 or 555, that's when he stopped showing up in church records, uh, was the first bishop buried in this mausoleum, and he probably moved the bones of St. Vincent there as well. He was buried in a place associated with the saint because the saint could confer his spiritual power on the deceased bishop, and Justinianus' epitaph stressed this connection with the saint. I won't read the whole inscription, it's, it's, it's long, uh, but I want to highlight several points. First, Justinianus refers to himself as, quote, building new templa, temples and restoring old ones. And he says that here, devoted in death, he gave everything he possessed to the glorious martyr Vincent whom he cared for assiduously and with sufficient piety while alive. So Justinianus wants to associate himself with the kind of large-scale construction projects in the city, uh, especially its churches, and with the cult of the martyr Vincent. Uh, so his inscription, his epitaph, brings together concern with construction projects, uh, concern with saintliness and the desire for individual commemoration, and unites these with what's the, really the key figure hosting the council that, that I'm talking about. Um, so, so much for the old custom of burying bishops, which seems to have been followed assiduously by Justinianus. What was threatening it? I translated the phrase uh, in loculo seorsum as on a beer apart from the others. Uh, this phrase is rare. I have not found a loculo seorsum used uh, anywhere in Latin literature. The constituent parts are quite common. Um, a, a study that I, I won't go into uh, shows that uh, loculus um, appears to not be the place that someone is buried, uh, but a separate place where a body is held before it's buried. Um, and seorsum, in its meaning apart from the others, is well attested. But we have to ask, who are these others? At this point, returning to the archaeology of La Moina can clarify this question. The area around La Moina has many mass graves. These are new in the middle of the 6th century, uh, according to the excavators. They represent a change in burial practices away from individual inhumation. Twelve of the tombs hold more than five bodies. Some of them are what Michael McCormick has turned to type two mass graves, where the bodies were placed in the tomb in multiple phases. Others of them are type one mass graves, which represent one inhumation event. Now, why this change from individual to multiple inhumation? At this point, we have to speculate a little bit. 
Uh, we know that when the first outbreaks of the Jacinic pandemic struck the Mediterranean in the 540s, some communities, although as we learned today, not all, um, and that's really, really interesting for this, struggled to maintain their traditional burial practices. Uh, these are some of the most poignant moments of our plague narratives, which otherwise can really be sort of quite measured. Procopius tells us that uh, when the Emperor Justinian created an office to sort of count the bodies and bury them, uh, they buried people in, in, in towers. I mean, they did all these things. And in the uh, Chronicle of Pseudo Dionysius of Telmar, uh, the Emperor had mass graves dug outside the city to stop the citizens of Constantinople from just dumping the bodies off boats into the harbor. Closer to Valencia, but a, a generation later, Gregory of Tours helpfully recounts that at Clermont in 571, many were buried in bunches. For, he recalls, quote, when they ran out of sarcophagi and tombstones, 10, or even more than that, were buried in one ditch in the ground. Could this be the reason that at least 212 individuals were buried in the 12 mass graves at Valencia? If it is, I think this would be uh, some of the first archaeological evidence for mass graves from the Justinian pandemic. Um, and I have, I've heard a rumor, and, this, and, and I think this is what it's really needed now, is that there's actually work being done on the mass graves of Valencia to see if there is ancient DNA evidence for um, the Justinian uh, pandemic for Justinian pestis, and that would be really, really helpful, or ruin my study, depending <laughs> what it says. Uh, <coughs> Although we do not know why these mass graves were used, we can try to imagine, based on the evidence that we have, something of the decision-making process of the bishops gathered in Valencia. In Valencia, not everybody was buried in an already existing tomb. There was also an elite cemetery, contemporaneous with the mass graves, in which each of the nine excavated tombs contains exactly one individual. This cemetery, described by the excavators as the Episcopal Cemetery, shows a concern for the individual commemoration of the deceased within the context of a broader shift towards mass inhumation. I believe that the bishops gathered in Valencia wanted to maintain their privileged position in death in the face of change caused by the bubonic plague. The term they used for the death of the bishops, a sudden death, a repentinus mors, suggests that they were. A repentinus mors occurs in late Latin literature as a sort of thing that can snatch someone away before she is baptized or can weaken an empire or diocese by taking away a good ruler. It is also used by Isidore of Seville, a 7th century uh, Spaniard, to describe the time span in which one dies of bubonic plague. Someone who becomes sick with plague, quote, does not have a space of time in which either life or death is awaited, but suddenly, repentinus, the sickness arrives at the same time as death. If a repentinus mores is due death due to the plague in a situation where bishops cannot come and the social hierarchy is under stress, we may be witnessing the elusive social impact of the first wave of bubonic plague in Spain. We have no accounts of the plague in Spain. There is no Procopius who narrates societal collapse, who tells us how it shook people's faith in God or in doctors or the state. But if we look for new types of literary evidence, for texts that do not mention the plague but under examination may show the signs of the strains it caused, we may be able to construct a broader picture of the social impact of Yersinia pestis in a society that stood on the brink of fundamental change. This is a project of historical imagination, which must by its nature take us away from the evidence and into our own conceptions about how people think and live and hope. But we can imagine that Justinianus did not want to be buried in a mass grave. A younger brother in a distinguished Episcopal family, he was building his own mausoleum, planning his own tomb, and preparing to wrap himself in the power of his own martyr. He wanted to be buried in a place of honor where his grave could later become a site that displayed the merit he had won in life. He might even have been hoping that someday his tomb would become a focus of cult activity. So he ordered that bishops not be buried suddenly. He ordered that they be attended in the hour of their passing. And he ordered that they be held in their own place, with the exanimatum corpusculum sacerdotus in loculo conditum seorsum, with the dead body of the bishop on a, placed on a bier apart from the others, so that the occasion might be lifted from slander and the old custom of bearing bishops be preserved. Thank you. <laughs>